When I did my launch reviews of the Core i9-12900K and Core i5-12600K, I also showed you this box marked in biro KitGuru 12700K, which is the Core i7-12700K. And I included figures for all three processors in my charts at the time. And you may have wondered what happened to my review of the Core i7-12700K, the processor that is in this very test bench, the MSI Z690 Unify. Well, I hit one or two small delays that sent me down a couple of blind alleys before I returned to the middle road. And now the day has arrived and it's time for my review of the Core i7-12700K. In the interim, I've received this from Intel, which frankly has no place in my life and I can't justify a separate video about it, so I'm gonna show it to you for a few seconds. This piece of A4 paper, double-sided, and this paperweight, perhaps? It's to do the Intel 4004 processor from 50 years ago to show how Intel has come on leaps and bounds from this to these. And quite frankly, that's all I have to say on the subject. Yes, Intel, you've made advances in 50 years and jolly well done. So returning to Intel 12th gen, when I reviewed these processors, I used this Corsair Vengeance DDR5 memory which is rated at 5200 mega transfers. It has latency 383838. And in the course of the review, I said on this MSI Unify motherboard, I had to set the XMP voltage manually. It was correctly detected as requiring 1.25 volts, but it didn't actually run properly or stably. But when I punched in 1.25, it was absolutely fine, which is a curious old thing. And G-Skill sent us this Ripjaws S5 memory. It runs on Micron integrated circuits. However, the latency of the G-Skill memory is slightly slower at 40 rather than 38 for the Corsair. However, the G-Skill runs on 1.1 volts. The snag is it didn't play nicely at all with the MSI Z690 Unify. So MSI told us about a beta BIOS that's available to reviewers. I don't think it's yet available on the public website. So I installed that BIOS. Now clearly I can't go around testing processors and then test a different processor on a different BIOS and swap memory. That's what sent me down a couple of uh, blind alleys. So I had to do my original testing, which you saw, and then I had to do updated testing with the updated BIOS and confirm the BIOS actually made no difference to performance whatsoever. It's purely to do with stability, which is good news. And the Rip Jaws memory, which is indeed slightly slower than the Corsair. So I did all my testing with the Corsair, but I plugged in the Rip Jaws and have done a couple of memory tests, which I'll be showing you as well. The effect of the latency difference is frankly trivial. I am, however, quite impressed by the fact that you can run this DDR5 memory on XMP on 1.1 volts. We are clearly entering a new era with the combination of Intel 12th gen, Z690 motherboards at the moment, other chipsets to come, and DDR5 memory. This is all very good news, but it doesn't often make my review of the Core i7-12700K slightly complicated. Happily, having given you that preamble, we can now park the various memories and the i5 and the i9, and we can bring in the test bench and the Core i7 12700K. Our test system consists of the MSI MEG Z690 Unify motherboard, processor obviously Core i7-12700K, and we have a Sabrent Rocket 4.0 SSD. Memory, as discussed, is G-Skill Rip Jaws S5. However, most of my testing was done with the Corsair Vengeance for the obvious reasons. Cooler is the Corsair H150i Elite LCD that I used in both the Core i5 and Core i9 reviews. And my graphics card, Palit Gaming Pro RTX 3080. The cables here are because I plug the three fans into the motherboard directly so I can control them over PWM rather than connecting them through IQ and Corsair's own hub. And these cables around here, which are unused, are for the RGB, because I don't need RGB on my test rig, do I? The power supply, Seasonic Prime Titanium, 850 watt.
Let us take a quick tour around the BIOS, which will appear familiar if you've watched either Macore i9 or Core i5 reviews, starting with the MSI Select Your Cooler to Set the Power Limits feature. And this is starting to get a little bit peculiar. With the Core i9, it kind of made sense. With the Core i5, it really didn't. And also the Core i7. So water cooler, power limit, 4,096 watts. It's unlimited, that's what that means. However, tower air cooler, 288 watts is beyond the stock power limit for the Core i7 and also what kind of tower air cooler does 288 watts? Box cooler 241 watts. Well now we're talking about Intel kind of power limits and yet look at the depiction of a box cooler 241 watts that's huge. Anyway we do indeed have a 360mm AIO so we'll go with that and let's select XMP motherboard overclock settings so we've got all the cores enabled just as you'd expect everything's on auto there we can see the g skill memory 40 40 40 76 and 1.1 volts and we go across to hardware monitor and we can see the fan control in the unified doing its exemplary job and into Windows. We can see in HW Info that the Core i7 has eight P cores and four E cores, so fewer E cores than the Core i9, more P cores than the Core i5. We also know it has a lower power limit, according to Intel, but not according to MSI, and it boosts to a lower speed. Let us start Blender and see what happens. Our P cores run at 4.7 gigahertz, our E cores at 3.6 gigahertz. Power limit over here, 4096 watts, as we saw in the BIOS. Actual CPU package power is 162, 163 watts. CPU package temp is in the low 60s. Ambient out here is lower than 20, so quite cool. Obviously, we haven't had a chance for any heat soak as yet but the temperatures are well under control, system is nice and quiet, and it's running at a decent speed. Let's dive into performance, which is after all what we want to know about. How does the Core i7 compare to the i9? And that mighty Core i5, the surprising Core i5. Is the new Core i7 a waste of silicon, or is it a diamond in the rough? Time for some charts. In 7-zip V19, the compressing test, Core i7 is high in the charts. You can overclock this processor by an easy 300 megahertz using the Intel Extreme Tuning Utility. And look at the results. We're going pretty much head to head with the 12 core Ryzen 9. In the decompressing test, not quite so impressive. Now the new i7 is beaten by the eight core Ryzen 7. Bapco Crossmark, the test that was pushed at us by Intel. For reasons I cannot explain, the Core i9 running on auto is at the top of the chart, then we have the three overclocked i9, i7, i5, and then the i7 on auto, followed by the i5 on auto. Blender Classroom. Core i7 is hard on the heels of the 12 core Ryzen 9. Looking good. Cinebench R23 Multicore. Core i7 drops behind the Core i9, to a slightly surprising extent when you consider they have the same number of performance cores. What you see here is the effect of those efficient cores. Cinebench R23 single core. The new Core i7 does well, but is beaten by the Core i9 as you'd expect, and also by the overclocked Core i5. Handbrake conversion H.264. The Core i7 is fighting it out fairly evenly with the 12 core Ryzen 9. And in handbrake with an H.265 conversion, the new Core i7 beats the 12 core Core i9 and is close to the 16 core Ryzen 9. 3D Mark Time Spy, just the CPU test. Core i7 close on the heels of the Core i9 and beating the Core i5. This chart dominated by the new Intel processors. In our gaming tests, we start with the venerable Deus Ex Mankind Divided at 1080p. We can see the overclocked Core i7 close to the top of the chart just behind the new i9, also overclocked. 
The i7 on auto, on the other hand, drops a fair way down and is pretty much on par with the i7 11th gen. Deus Ex at 1440p, it's a similar story. Overclocked, the i7 is doing very well. On auto, it's in the middle of the chart. Moving on to a newer game, Far Cry 6 at 1080p, the overclocked i7 doing very nicely. On auto, doing perfectly okay, but less impressive. Far Cry 6 at 1440p, the two results incredibly close. Far Cry New Dawn at 1080, the overclocked i7 close to the top of the chart, the i7 on auto much further down. Far Cry New Dawn at 1440, again the i7 doing perfectly okay, but more or less in the middle of the chart. Watch Dogs Legion at 1080. Just look at the i7, both overclocked and on auto. The results are very similar, but in this test, the spread of frame rates is small. Watch Dogs Legion 1440p. The i7 drops down the chart. This one dominated by AMD. However, look, the frame rates are pretty much identical. And then we move on to the technical tests. Ada 64 memory latency. The new processors are using DDR5, and we can see that the Core i7, both with the Corsair memory and G-Skill, right down the bottom of the chart. However, the G-Skill is slightly slower than Corsair. In the Ada 64 memory bandwidth test, you can see the Intel 12th gen processors dominate this chart. Not surprisingly, DDR5 has monumental bandwidth. You can see here the G-Skill losing out slightly to the Corsair. Our value for money benchmark, we take Cinebench R23 score, we divide by the cost in pounds. This is dominated by the Core i5, which is an absolute jewel. However, the Core i7 is not that far behind. It's a good value processor, it performs well. Similarly, Cinebench R23 score divided by watts. This is the system power at the wall, not just the processor. The Core i7 does well. However, Ryzen 9 is far more efficient and does brilliantly. CPU temperature in Blender. The Core i7 12700K on auto is drawing 170 watts and you can see it runs at a steady 72 degrees Celsius with a 360mm AIO cooler. Overclocked the processor by a few hundred megahertz and now we're looking at 210 watts for the package power. Temperature is under control at 85 Celsius unlike the overclocked Core i9, which is just out of hand. Power consumption for the system. The Core i7 on auto, the system's drawing 290 watts, overclocked 349 watts. Perfectly acceptable numbers, but this chart, as you'd expect, dominated by AMD. Wading through all those graphs for effectively the third time, Core i9, Core i5, now Core i7, has really brought home a big point to me. When Intel started discussing their hybrid architecture for 12th gen Alder Lake, and they were talking about 8P cores and 8E cores, which most of us were thinking of as atom cores, we pretty much all came to the thought of, shame that, be much better if it was 10P cores and 0E cores. And I was not hugely impressed by Core i9, far too hot, far too juicy, no margin for overclocking, at least with my sample. By contrast, Core i5, an absolute belter, storming performance, doesn't take much power, really good. And now the Core i7, which sits obviously between those two processors. And the conclusion I've reached is that the P cores, the Golden Cove cores on Intel 7 uh, process, aren't particularly great. The E cores, the Gracemont cores, they are what save Intel 12th gen. So cutting the E cores from eight in the Core i9 to four in the Core i7, it really makes a significant difference in some of our performance charts, much more difference than I would ever have expected in the first place. And now I've looked through those charts again, it's really come home. However, Core i7 is 200 pounds cheaper than Core i9, the Core i9 that I don't much like. So my conclusion to this review is, forget about Core i9 12900K. Core i7 12700K makes far better sense. However, Kit Guru's vote still goes to the Core i5 12600K. So when Intel said to me, 
when we're heading into the launch of these processors, yes, yes, we'll give you a Core i7, but don't focus on it too much. Here's the i9, here's the i5. They were completely correct. The i9 has the kind of headline performance figures and the i5 is the one you should buy and the i7 falls in the middle. So here are my detailed pros and cons for the Core i7-12700K. The i7 offers decent gaming performance. The combination of the 8P cores and the 4E cores is a decent combination. It's much better value than the Core i9-12900K. You can easily overclock it by 300 megahertz. Again, this is significant, the i9, you can push it by 100 megahertz, or mine at any rate, and it's a bad move. The i5, I could push by 500 megahertz. This i7, exactly in the middle, 300 megahertz, and it's a sensible overclock. And it runs nice and cool under load. And then we have the cons, the negatives. A Z690 motherboard and DDR5 memory will cost you a small fortune. When the sub Z chipsets come out at CES next, uh, next, not quite next month, a few weeks away, uh, no doubt those motherboards will be cheaper, but you'll still be looking at DDR5 if you want the full joy of Intel 12th gen, so still quite an expensive step up. The reduced number of E cores in the Core i7 hurts performance compared to the i9, uh, to my mind more so than the slight reduction in clock speed. And Intel's power efficiency still requires work. The Intel 7 process, this current architecture, they've been delayed for ages. Uh, no doubt the next uh, iterations will be better, but this has been the case for so long with Intel. You know, wait till the next version. This is getting there, but it's still not there. AMD Zen 3 on TSMC 7 nanometer shows the way that power efficiency can go on the desktop. That's it. Core i7-12700K is done. However, I do have one more video on the Intel 12th gen processors to come in the near future, and that's before we get to the new releases of processors. I've been doing some testing, and I think I found something that might interest you.